Alors, uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, Mr. Consul General, dear participants and speakers, uh, chers participants, uh, the, welcome uh, to our webinar of the Business in Tandem series. Uh, it is an initiative from the City of Montreal uh, in partnership with the Chamber of Commerce of Mon Metropolitan Montreal, seeking to expand connections with other cities worldwide. So today's topic is business opportunities between companies in Tel Aviv and Montreal with a focus on the deep tech sector. My name is Alexandra Meyer and I'm Senior Communications Director at Bonjour Startup Montreal and I'm very pleased to moderate this webinar with you today. Uh, first of all, please let me take a moment to thank, to thank the partners and sponsors who made this event possible. So starting with the City of Montreal, in association with the city of Tel Aviv and Tel Aviv Global, the General Consulate of Israel in Montreal, Bonjour Startup Montreal, as well as the Economic Development Agency of Canada for the regions of Quebec for its ongoing support of World Trade Center Montreal's activities. So let me first give you a few logistical information before we start uh, the webinar and before presenting to you all the participants. So if you have any questions for our panelists, please, uh, they will be addressed at the end of the webinar. You can write them in the designated Q&A box, which you will find at the bottom center of your screen. Also, I would like you to uh, please indicate who you are addressing your question to. So I will also ask, your, um, ask you to write the questions in the official language of your choosing, uh, French or English. Um, and I will be happy to translate for you if needed. Uh, donc, vous pouvez poser vos questions en français si vous le désirez, et uh, je serai heureuse de faire la traduction pour vous au besoin. Also, if you would like to watch this webinar again, uh, we will make a recording available on the Chamber of Commerce of Metropolitan's website, uh, and it will be also available on the, its YouTube channel. And the PowerPoints uh, that you will see uh, will be shared with you in a follow-up email, uh, so they will be made available to you. Uh, and finally, uh, the webinar uh, will be followed by half an hour networking session at the end, so where you can meet and network with participants. Some panelists will also be available. Uh, so at the end of the, the event, some of you will be invited directly on the platform to join pre-assigned meetings. Uh, with different participants, or alternatively, you can also join the open networking session groups featured on the calendar. So I will get back to this at the end of the webinar part uh, of the session. So I would like now to invite uh, Véronique Doucet, Director, Economic Development Department at the City of Montreal, to address some opening remarks to you. Bonjour, merci Alexandra. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to be with you today for the Business in Tandem event series. As Alexandra just said, it's a joint initiative with our partner, the Chamber of Commerce of Metropolitan Montreal, also with Tel Aviv Global and Tourism, which who I say a good morning to everybody from Tel Aviv, and the Consulate General of Israel in Montreal, with whom we have established excellent relationship over the years. Also, Bonjour Startup Montreal, Alexandra, with your team that you are with us this morning, close collaboration in Montreal for the startup community that we have with you. The city of Montreal has planned, just for you to know where business in tandem comes, uh, the city of Montreal has planned the business in tandem initiative when we began to see the pandemic related the constraint that put our companies under major challenges when trying to conduct interprovincial or international business development activities. So we had to find a way to make, uh, give a, a hand to our companies to go through that, uh, that pandemic that we were still in, eh? finally. We hope that it will end one day. So Tel Aviv and Montreal didn't start the relationship with the pandemic. We started way before that. Uh, it started in fact with the economic mission that we did first in 2012 and also another one in 2016, during which we had the opportunity to learn more about the inspiring, but certainly the thriving startup ecosystem that you have uh, back uh, in Tel Aviv. So it, I think that uh, that relationship and those mission has led to organize this activity that we have with you today. 
So also I would like to highlight the fact that Montreal and Tel Aviv are uh, both UNESCO creative city networks. So we're related for, for our, our startup, but also with the, uh, the UNESCO creative uh, city network that we have. So today, uh, the edition of today is the fifth edition, if I don't mistake myself. Uh, the business in tandem will focus more on emerging sector for our two cities. So specifically the deep tech and also more broadly, how we can help startups scale up. So you have all kinds of uh, speaker today, top speaker, I should say, uh, that are uh, been are regrouped for you this morning and will really give you a hand. So I wish that you, you can hear all the session and uh, make sure that you enjoy and, and get the opportunity that you can have with uh, the, our speaker that we'll have this morning. So uh, finally, I would also have uh, like to mention the presence of our colleague from Montreal International that are with us this morning, our investment uh, promotion agency. So, and I could not fin finish my, uh, my speech this morning before thanking all the panelists that we have for both of our city that are with us this morning. So enjoy the activity. Uh, make sure that uh, you can reach out together after the activity also and uh, have a good one. So good morning to everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Veronique. So I would like to hand it over now to Sharon Landis-Fisher, CEO from, T from sorry, Tel Aviv Global. Yeah, Alexandra, thank you very much. Good, mo good, uh, good morning, uh, fellow uh, Canadians. Uh, bon après-midi, uh, uh, Israelien, uh, tous Israelien. Uh, so uh, I want to thank you, Veronique and Alexandra, for uh, this kind introduction. And uh, I want to address all of you, uh, dear uh, Consul General, of course, uh, colleagues, entrepreneurs, and tech lovers. A shalom and bonjour. Um, so I'm Sharon Landis, CEO of Tel Aviv Global and Tourism, an initiative by the mayor's office to elevate Tel Aviv's position uh, globally. Uh, and I'm happy to open this uh, much anticipated webinar uh, in collaboration with our partners from Montreal. Uh, it is exciting to learn how different ecosystems operate, how they expand and what they aspire to become. From our side, Tel Aviv ecosystem has seen tremendous growth uh, in the last decade, especially in the last year, and continues to reach new levels of maturity. Uh, we in Tel Aviv are fortunate, very fortunate, to have a mix of characteristics that carved the path for us to be a leading global hub. We are a modest, sit modest size city and country and so startups who want to make it big, they think globally from the get-go, from day one. That topped with, the, with an amazing talent pool that lives in Tel Aviv and a proactive public policy that hopefully we execute here. Fueled with the Tel Aviv vibrant non-stop non -stop spirit are key elements for, our, for nurturing and encouraging the development of a tech industry. Tel Aviv Municipality supports the creation of early stage initiatives and startups with its hubs of innovation, supporting young entrepreneurs with networking, acceleration, mentors, and specific programs. Since many of our companies see themselves as Tel Aviv born and raised and want to keep growing and expanding in the city, we are currently developing the right format to support them to grow and mature within our city. So I wanna thank you all for joining us today and hope you'll have a meaningful meeting. Uh, I wish you a very pleasant afternoon and best of luck to all of you, both Canadians and Israelis. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Well, thank you very much, Sharon. I, I can't wait uh, until the end of the pandemic to finally go and see your lovely city. It sounds so exciting. And you can we'll hear... see the weather. You can see the weather from just from what I'm wearing. Yes, I can see beach. it. It's yeah. Uh, yeah, very enticing, really. So we'll hear more about uh, Tel Aviv's uh, ecosystem a little bit later. Uh, but first, we have uh, two uh, two panelists 
who will talk a little bit more about the Montreal ecosystem. So uh, we have Alan Backley, Director Foreign Investments Northern Europe from Montreal International, followed by Richard Chenier, CEO uh, of uh, Centec. So we'll uh, start with Alan. I'll hand it over to you. Alan, you're on mute. Excuse me, thanks. Uh, I, sh I, should, uh, I should be uh, used to it by now. Uh, I said good morning, good afternoon, and shalom, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, uh, for your time, uh, everyone. Um, so yeah, the intent uh, today for me is really to give you a little bit of a, an overview of the uh, Montreal ecosystem. Like Alexandra said, uh, we're the economic development uh, organization uh, in, in Montreal, so supporting any foreign company, including Israeli companies, looking at Montreal to set up operations. Um, so a little bit of uh, information about Montreal, the second largest city in Canada, uh, with a population of uh, uh, a little bit over 4 million residents in the greater Montreal area. Very diverse, uh, a lot of uh, Montrealers were born outside of the country, all their parents were born outside of the country. Bilingual city, uh, many people are trilingual. Um, it's been uh, the city where we've, uh, we've uh, enjoyed the uh, the, 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 the most economic growth during the past years prior to the pandemic. Uh, it's also uh, the, the city that had the, the most resilient uh, economy during the pandemic uh, with the least uh, uh, job destruction. So pretty resilient uh, economy overall. Uh, and uh, we've managed to attract a lot of foreign investments over the past years. And this year is going to be probably a record year as well. Uh, so uh, billions of dollars of foreign investments coming to Montreal and mainly in the tech sectors. Uh, Greater Montreal is composed of 82 municipalities in addition to uh, including uh, the, the Montreal municipality, uh, pretty close to Boston, to New York, uh, and very close to the border as well, as well uh, regarding uh, logistics uh, considerations. Um, sorry. Technical glitch. Okay, should be good now. Um, we like to, uh, to to present Montreal as a gateway to the North American market, which it is actually, and uh, Canada has, has the, the the most uh, uh, trade agreements with uh, with uh, foreign countries, uh, including you know with uh, the European Union, with the US, um, and so it makes uh, Canada and Montreal a really an interesting gateway for any foreign companies wanting to not only penetrate the Canadian market, but the entire North American market. Um, it, it, I alluded to it, but uh, uh, we are definitely in the 21st century in Montreal. A lot of uh, companies and, uh, and uh, important sectors in uh, IT, software development, aerospace, uh, uh, life sciences, uh, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, I mean, under IT uh, sector. Uh, so very, uh, uh, very dynamic and, um, and innovating uh, ecosystem with organizations of different sizes. You can see here, uh, you know, uh, well-known logos, very large companies, but also a pretty dynamic startup ecosystem that uh, Richard is going to tell you more about. Uh, there are uh, interesting synergies between AI and cybersecurity. Uh, the Canadian and the Quebec government invested massively in developing uh, uh, AI know-how expertise uh, over the past decades, and now it's starting paying off, where we have a lot of uh, machine learning uh, engineers in Montreal uh, transferring to companies, whether large or smaller, starting their own business. Uh, and, and the government keeps uh, supporting these initiatives with uh, some grants, with some investments through institutional investors that trickles down into VCs. There are clusters such as Scale AI to um, deploy AI capabilities in the supply chain uh, sectors, uh, sector. Uh, and and it's, it's really synergistic with cybersecurity. We also have a lot of uh, prominent researchers and uh, research chairs in cybersecurity and an increasing number of companies in cybersecurity in Montreal, all uh, uh, companies uh, uh, setting up cybersecurity capabilities such as banks and all kinds of, uh, of companies. So uh, I think it's, it's interesting for, uh, for Israeli companies where I know you are, you're pretty strong in those uh, fields as well. Um, the, the, the financing is important. 
uh, for innovation. Uh, and uh, it, it might be a little bit counterintuitive for some people, but uh, thinking that you know Toronto is a is where you have all of the capital in uh, in Canada. Uh, it's true, but the venture capital is uh, is also a lot in Montreal. Um, and uh, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, seven of the most prominent VCs in Canada are in Montreal. And uh, maybe you recognize some logos here. You've heard of them. Real, Real Ventures, Innovia, White Star, for instance. Um, they are important uh, VCs in Canada. They are based in Montreal. They have presence uh, in some other places for some of them, but uh, they, they are. Uh, in Montreal and headquartered in Montreal, and you can so also see some logos here on the on, on the slide, uh, like BDC, uh, Investissement Québec, Invest Quebec, uh, CDPQ, Caisse de Dépôt et Placement. These are institutional investors that are LPs, limited partners in the VCs in Montreal, and so that's a, a reason why those those LPs are headquartered here in Montreal. So that's one of the, the reasons why VCs are also uh, very present in Montreal. It's because the, the money trickles down from those institutional investors in Montreal. Um, and, and those VCs, um, uh, for some of them, run accelerators as well. Uh, so it, um, it, 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 can, it, it fosters uh, innovation and uh, transfer of the technology transfer for, from the universities to, uh, to companies. There are some uh, sector specific VCs as well, as you can see on the right hand side of the slide. Uh, um, and so all of this uh, results in uh, Montreal showing the, the highest concentration of tech jobs uh, in, in uh, Canada. Uh, in absolute numbers, Toronto is slightly ahead, but in relative numbers compared to the population, uh, Montreal is, is really far ahead of the, uh, of the, the, the crowd. Um, so it's the, the fifth uh, highest concentration of tech jobs in the U.S. and Canada. Um, so very uh, and, and very dynamic ecosystem. Relative relative abundance of tech talent. Uh, most competitive operating uh, cost. I think you know I like to say that uh, you find in Montreal a combination of uh, the type of talent uh, you would find on the coast of the U.S., meaning you know on the east coast, on the west coast, but with the cost of operations that you find more in the southern states or central states of the U.S. Uh, so that's an interesting combination. You know, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves if you compare to Boston, New York, or San Francisco, uh, which are ecosystems where are usually compared to. Montreal is way, way, way more affordable for companies to operate. So your, your runway, your, your burn rate is going to be lower. Your runway is going to be uh, longer. Uh, and, uh, and so that's, again, cost-efficient uh, gateway to the North American market. Um, on top of that, uh, you have some uh, tax incentives uh, that are very interesting, that are very geared toward innovation and software development, R&D in general, upskilling your people. So uh, it makes for, for a very compelling uh, uh, um, a package uh, if you want to set up in Montreal. Um, sometimes uh, there is a preconceived idea that, oh, taxes must be high uh, because they have a pretty um, developed uh, social system and healthcare system in, in Quebec, but uh, actually when you look at the corporate tax rate, it's more competitive than what you have in California or the state of New York or in a lot of the uh, U.S. states. Uh, so uh, from a, a corporate tax perspective, pretty uh, pretty interesting, pretty competitive. Uh, here, I'm not going to go into the, all the details of all of the tax incentives, but I just wanted to, to convey that uh, there are some uh, broad spectrum, spectrum tax incentives. There are some industry specific tax incentives for the development of video games, et cetera, for instance. There are some uh, really upskilling uh, focus type of uh, uh, tax incentives where you get money back when you train your people between 25 and sometimes 75% of the money you spend to train your people uh, in-house or outside uh, of, of the company. Um, and, and something I think that uh, I'd like to insist a little bit more on is uh, the e-business tax credit, uh, which is uh, basically 30% back on your software development cost. Um, that's uh, specific to Quebec. You don't find this uh, uh, in, in too many places. Uh, I believe you don't find this anywhere in North America. So very, very interesting uh, tax incentives to reduce your, uh, your cost of innovation, your cost of operations. In Montreal. Uh, to, to, to top it off, uh, low cost of living. Uh, I made the move, maybe you can tell by my accent, I moved here 10 years ago. I was living in France uh, and uh, we can afford 
uh, a, a very high quality of life here. Uh, the cost of living is way lower than what you find in New York, San Francisco, or Boston. Um, and uh, you don't necessarily have to make long commutes to have a decent place to live with your family. Uh, housing is uh, affordable. Uh, uh, medical uh, insurance is affordable as well. Um, and childcare is very affordable. So very um, uh, family friendly uh, syst uh, system and city uh, and uh, high quality of life overall, uh, really at the crossroads of Europe and the US and, and in North America, basically you have a really a very nice mix in terms of the environment you, you live in, um, the food you have access to, et cetera. Uh, and uh, and the quality of life is is really really pretty pretty amazing. Uh, again, very safe environment, uh, uh, very affordable education, um, very vibrant uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, city with concerts, festivals, restaurants, uh, all kinds of things. Very multicultural. So uh, uh, really, I, I love uh, being here, and uh, I'm sure you'd uh, enjoy. Uh, staying in Montreal for a couple of years or for a living. Um, again, just to before I wrap up, Montreal International Economic Development Organization, our service is entirely free and confidential. Uh, we hold your hand when you want to set up in Montreal. We keep holding your hand when you want to strive and grow in Montreal. Uh, we provide you with economic data, comprehensive, up-to-date economic data to make an informed decisions, to build your business case, to decide where you want to set up. And uh, we have comparative data with other ecosystem that is fair and sourced. Um, uh, we facilitate government relations, access to the incentives. Um, um, uh, we put you in relationship uh, in, in relation with uh, the, the professional services provider, so you don't waste time, you know, shopping for someone that is going to be the right fit for you. We know those guys in the ecosystem, and, and we would be able to suggest what is the right fit for you. But there is no obligation, and we can set up as many meetings as you want. Uh, to uh, uh, select the best service provider uh, you want to deal with. Um, we can help you out, hold your hand to get the work permits for your employees. If you want to move them here to Canada, which is immigration friendly country, uh, we will hold your hand to apply for some uh, tax incentives, uh, government programs as well. Uh, we do internal recruitment missions uh, if you don't find talent here. Um, and all of our services are free. Uh, confidential again so uh, you should never feel shy to reach out so that's my contact information and I'm gonna pass it on to uh, Richard Chenier from uh, Santec um, and it's going to be probably more uh, deep tech uh, focused. Thank you Alan so I will share my screen uh, so if you can okay thank you uh, so my name is Richard Signier, CEO of Santec, a deep tech incubator in uh, in Montreal. So I don't know if everybody sees uh, see my screen. That's yes. perfect. So welcome to Montreal. Bienvenue à Montréal, a vibrant startup ecosystem. So uh, Montreal is a, a young uh, startup ecosystem. So but we grew up very fast in the last few years with different stakeholders. As Alan said, we, we have a very good VC network, investors in Canada. Uh, VC investors in Canada are mainly in Montreal, but also we have other stakeholders as incubator, accelerator, hub, and different uh, parts uh, to build a strong ecosystem here in Montreal. So um, when, you, uh, when we go deeper around incubator and accelerator, you can see we have some more generalist accelerator, accelerator and incubator as D3, uh, X1, and many more. Uh, some specialized, some some of them are specialized in fintech, clean tech, culture, and and different subsectors. And we have a strong network for AI and deep tech entrepreneurs as Santec. So the good news for Montreal. Um, so in the last uh, ranking of the startup genome uh, in the startup genome report, Montreal um, Montreal gained five rank in the in in the global uh, ranking, uh, and now we are thirty first, and we are still growing. And the strength for the startup ecosystem here in Montreal, life science is a, a great um, one of our strengths. Uh, AI, big data, analytic, we are very good in it. Uh, automation, manufacturing and robotic, energy, and also telecom 
uh, we are very good in this area, mainly because we have a strong uh, network, a, a very good, um, we have very good research centers, but also uh, the, our university network are very great also. So that can provide a pool of talent and, and, and this is, um, this is um, especially for deep tech, this is a good place to be because we can do a lot of spin-off from our research centers, but also using uh, the talent pool that we have in, uh, within our universities. Um, so why deep tech matter? Uh, so uh, first of all, a few, uh, a few uh, explanation of, uh, around deep tech because it's, it's pretty new and we see uh, a global shift uh, in the startup ecosystem because actually uh, the next trend for startups are deep tech. But what is, what is a deep tech startup? A deep tech startups are those who solve concrete problems with innovation, pro innovative product uh, based on science and engineering. And this is why Montreal is very good and, and Montreal will be a global leader for uh, deep tech startups because as I said, of the quality of our research centers, but also the quality of our universities. And the med main subsectors affected by uh, deep tech, uh, med tech health, um, automation, industry 4.0, uh, transportation, logistic, energy, and env environment, telecom, and electronics are the main subsectors. We have other one in ag tech, in fintech, and so on. But the complexity of the deep tech uh, startups are they are using different technologies. So AI with nanotech, with telecom, with cybersecurity. So the product are more complex than what we can find sometime in web, with web, web platform or app or other uh, kind of startups. So why Canada and, and especially, specifically Montreal, as you can, as you can see, Montreal um, has the, the, the third global uh, deep tech pool of talents per capita. And, and we, are, um, we are very good because, uh, because um, uh, Quebec and especially Montreal has all the ingredients to, uh, to be successful uh, in the deep tech sector. And, and when you see the number of engineers per capita in, uh, in Canada, Montreal is the number one city in, uh, in Canada. So um, you see 5.3 um, 5 uh, engineer per, uh, per thousand, uh, a thousand of uh, citizens. So this is a great place to build uh, a deep tech startups because we have the pool of talent um, uh, needed to, uh, to start a deep tech company. Um, so about the deep tech sector, what's the particularity of the deep tech um, uh, companies? Um, is sometimes they have to manage two different things. So the first things that they have to manage is the R&D risk. You can find that kind of risk in biotech, uh, but in deep tech, they, they also have to manage this. So this is why sometimes it's a little bit longer uh, than a regular startups to, uh, to, to launch. Uh, but at the same time, the reward at the end of the day, uh, it's, it, it's a little bit higher because these kind of companies are more sustainable uh, long term. The other, the other challenge that deep tech startup has is the, 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 the product market risk. So the go to market, as I said, is a little bit longer. So, um, so we have to, 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 to accelerate the product development just to be sure that the window uh, for this new technology, um, we don't want a deep tech startup to miss the train. So we have to accelerate the product development and also at the same time uh, manage the risk, uh, the risk around the R and D um, uh, for uh, to, to build a, um, a sustainable product. Um, so, uh, but as you can see, if we create a link between deep tech startups and also uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goal, 97% of, the, of these goals um, are addressed by deep tech startups. So uh, in, in, around every challenge that we have 
around climate change and also in health. So deep tech startups sometimes are the respond, uh, can respond to these uh, major challenges. And this is why deep tech is so important. And, and, and Montreal, as I said, has a very good, great network for deep tech entrepreneurs. So the, the, the natural journey of a deep tech uh, startups, it starts, um, it, it's often start in research centers and also in universities. And, and Tel Aviv in Israel is very good to, to do more, a lot of tech transfer from universities. And, uh, and, and after, uh, at the beginning, the government funding is so important for deep tech startups because they, they need to mature their product. And, and, and in Canada, as Alan said, we have a very great network to support funding for uh, research and help uh, researchers to, uh, to mature their technology. After that, there are some tech transfer offices to help uh, the, the tech transfer, but also we need incubator specialized in deep tech. So as Santec, we, uh, we know how to manage IP and, and, and all the challenges around deep tech companies. And, um, and we have created a deep tech investment fund uh, last year to support early stage companies in, in that sector. And also BDC has created a major fund for deep tech uh, companies. And, uh, and around this, so a lot of buzzword as AI, quantum, uh, cybersecurity, but uh, at the end of the day, we want to support the product that we can, um, we can launch and um, uh, from our universities. So um, when, you see, when you compare software um, startups with deep tech startups, uh, after a few time, uh, the deep tech start the value of the deep tech startups are the same uh, after uh, after a, 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 a certain runway. Uh, so, but but the evolution of a startups the the first steps are a little bit longer than the software, as you can see in uh, in the startup value chart. Um, so, but. In the last five years, we saw more and more investment in deep tech. So 11% uh, of the startup funding between 2014 and 2019 were in uh, some deep tech startups. And it's still growing. But at the end, the results was very good. And it's still very good because 17% of the unicorns are deep tech startups. So, and this is why deep tech is a major opportunities for everyone. So Montreal is a major potential in deep tech. So um, in, in research, we are top five in the, in, in the OECD ranking in research. So we do a great research, but the challenge that we have actually, we have to do more to commercialize the quality of our research. And this is the challenge that the new Quebec Innovation Council has so how we create, can create more value with what we do in research. Also, um, uh, Alan told us that the tax incentive are very great in, in Quebec, especially, uh, and in Canada, maybe one of the, the world's best um, ecosystem for a tax incentive. So this is a very, um, uh, it, it's a major leverage for uh, deep tech startups. And also, uh, Montreal is a top five greatest, one of the greatest city for university students. So we can attract a lot of talents from Quebec, but also from elsewhere. So if you want to expand our, your activities uh, with Montreal, I think this is a land, actually this is a land of opportunities, especially by the shift the, to uh, deep tech startups. Uh, for investors in deep tech, uh, there's a lot of quality here in Montreal. Uh, in life science and uh, AI and uh, automation and all of these stuff. So you, 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 can, you can take uh, this opportunity if you want to invest in some of our companies. For the tech startups who want to expand their market. So if some, some companies from Israeli uh, wants to come in Montreal, this is a great place to be, especially if you want to expand your market in North America because of our talent pool. And, 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 and to conclude, to be part of a global network, uh, especially for deep tech startups, if you want to expand your network and create 
trustability relationship with good incubator, Montreal is a good place to be for deep tech. So thank you, Alexandra. So uh, now the floor is yours. Thank you, Richard, uh, for this uh, interesting presentation. Thank you, Alan, as well. Uh, so now uh, I'm very curious to uh, hand it over to our uh, partners from Tel Aviv to learn uh, more about uh, their part of the, their ecosystem. So I introduce uh, Michal Michaeli, who is uh, International Economic Development Director at Tel Aviv Global and Tourism, as well as uh, Inbal Arieli, who is author serial entrepreneur and tech influencer, as well as founder at Synthesis. So the floor is all yours. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for having us. It's a great initiative that we were very happy to be part of. And thank you for Ellen and Richard for your uh, portrayal of Montreal. I'm, I'm coming. I'm just waiting for the pandemic to end. Uh, but it, yeah, it really gave a great taste of uh, um, a city that is really um, a, a suitable partner for us. Now, as uh, Alexander said, I'm from Tel Aviv Global. You met our CEO earlier, Sharon, and we are the municipality's international arm. We are dealing with everything international, starting with tourism, going through the international media and communication, all the way to the economic development, focusing mostly on our prime and uh, most and leading uh, industry, which is the innovation and the high tech. I want to remind you just a few figures about Tel Aviv. You can see the beautiful coastline. And I specifically refrain from putting amazing beach um, pictures and uh, telling you, but I can't really hold myself for saying that we have over 30, 100, 360, uh, 330, sorry, days of sunshine a year. Um, but we eventually we're a very small city, uh, only 50 some kilometers, um, square kilometers. And it's amazing to see that we are actually 10% in the population than Montreal, for example, only less than half a million people spread around Tel Aviv. Out of them around third are very young. And this is part of our, our vibrant um, atmosphere, our vibrant, um, ecosystem, the fact that we have so many young in European or uh, advanced cities, it's usually very, um, it's not very common to see that many young people be part of the ecosystem and the city itself. Now, Tel Aviv is known to be the center of Israeli culture, art, travel, cuisine, um, and we see ourselves as another type of a capital for the uh, country. Now it's known that we are the startups again, the startup nation, and we want to tell you a little bit more about that and what it means actually to be on one hand the leading uh, city and with hosting only 20% of the personnel working in the high tech and 30% of the companies, but be responsible for over 50% of the investment raised and almost 50% of the exits in the country. Now, Tel Aviv X system is comprised of almost 30,000 companies, and we see 2,750 of them as startups in different stages, and we'll get a little bit into it later. And 115 foreign R&D company centers of, of international multinational companies. As I said, it's about a third of the country. And if you see, you take the greater Tel Aviv area, you get to almost half of the startup in the country, all focused around Tel Aviv in this very, very dense um, part. Now, for specifically for Tel Aviv residents, it stands for a startup for, for every 154 um, residents. And I will say that as in LA, before the pandemic, when you used to go to LA and every next um, waiter or um, barista in the coffee shop, who just hand you their script that they were working on. The same here, if you are going to a cafe, you see people working on their next startup and their next ventures, and they will be very happy to give you their elevator pitch. Those foreign R&D centers, those multinational companies that we have here, actually we have over 120. These are the end of 2020 numbers. You can probably identify the logos and you know many of them came in the last decade, but we have also companies that originally here like Google and uh, Microsoft and IBM that started even in the 90s. 
and you have you can see here representative that we uh, hear more later the TD bank that uh, Nir will tell you a little bit about the work in the Tel Aviv ecosystem from their perspective. But this is something that we take a lot of pride in and we try to support, nurture, affect and, and keep with drawing here more and more companies to support the ecosystem, to actually um, solidify the international feeling of the ecosystem. And we really think they're uh, putting a, strength, a lot of the strength into it. Now, as uh, Sharon said in the beginning, the ecosystem matured in the past few years or the last decade. It depends who you're asking extremely. And you can see it in the fact that the, those scale up companies, companies that before it was very known that Tel Aviv or Israeli companies are starting as a startup, getting recognized and being bought very easily and exits in a few, in a few dozens of uh, million dollars, are now usually. Um, focusing on growing, raising larger funds on IPOs. And you see all these companies that now some of them are already uh, leaders in their field, like Fiverr, like Wix, like Monday, and Iron Source, and others. And uh, they are also very important part of the ecosystem, being not only companies that are big and stable and have a lot of money to support the ecosystem as well, but also it's usually founders that see as a mission, see as their part to give back to the ecosystem, to support other young entrepreneurs, to support different um, uh, events and activities of the ecosystem, different part of it. So this is also something that is very unique and very, very um, evident here in the ecosystem. Now, is, uh, I think it was Alan that says uh, that, of course, you can't really do anything without money. So we, we're actually surprised in a sense to understand how much we became a magnet for international investors. We have here in Tel Aviv, only in the city, over 770 different investors. Almost 70% of them come from other um, countries, other than Israel, 35 other countries. You can see the leading one here, but actually it's very, very widespread. You can see also in the last four or five years, been a great major growth in it and huge, mostly in VCs that came in different markets that started acting, starting with the Chinese and Japanese and followed by other companies as well. So there's a lot of money being poured into the ecosystem from international uh, players. Now, 2020, despite the pandemic, despite uh, in the beginning uh, how we all thought this was going to be it, it uh, was a record-breaking year in the sense that we, and this is also the Tel Avivian numbers, almost $7 billion in investment of capital raised for companies in different stages. It was around, as I said, half of Israel. And we had almost $5 billion in exits, again, half of Israel. And actually 2020, ah, sorry, and we had 20 unicorns that we, uh, was established in 2020. And um, as much as we were very proud and they can see that 2021 is even taking this trend forward. Now, when we were looking into just to see, this is the number that we just posted a few months back, I think like six, five, six months ago. These are the 20 unicorns and the small symbols that you see around are what happened to them since the end of the year or the beginning of this year, actually. So you see one that was bought and merged. You see um, six IPOs, that nine mega rounds of investment, over $100 million each. So you can see that actually, even if we're trying to keep track of those unicorns, now we have actually over 30 um, in different capacity. But it's amazing to see even the speed of things that it's really hard to keep track of. Since we wanted to talk about deep tech, we feel that Tel Aviv is becoming from those startup city that you could see startup under every cafe and to this deep tech capital in the sense that our leading sectors are the heavy technology ones that need the Israeli um, support and uh, focus on this, uh, these sectors. If it's AI that we have over 700 companies under the AI um, sector and leading on to cybersecurity, which is as well very known that the Israeli and the Tel Aviv ecosystem is enjoying in a way 
all the um, attributes that they get from the army. And I think Inbal also can talk about this a bit later. Um, I think, uh, Richard, you talked about uh, Startup Kino. We actually, um, it's being number seven in the world, just up until uh, last year, we were number six. And we understand that this is not because we're doing anything wrong, because you can see even in the data, how we're prospering and how things are getting. Every city, just as Montreal, is trying to give it its best and understand that it has to invest in this area. And we're among it, and we uh, um, try to support all the ecosystem in, in Tel Aviv and coming into it from abroad. Now, as I say, as I said, um, Tel Aviv actually has to offer a lot. It's focusing mon mostly on its field, on the fact that, as I said, it's a very close, very dense, very active ecosystem. You can come to Tel Aviv and enjoy a lot of these events and meet people, and everything is very close encounters. You can go up to people, and it's very easy to start the, the conversation and get them to help you many times. We have a very, very good talent. And I said that we have over 135 accelerators and incubator programs in the city. Uh, but also Tel Aviv University is known for um, manufacturing uh, founders that know how to raise money and succeed. So that's also something that you can really use in their international program, for example. And as I said, we have a lot of support starting from each, each, um, each um, entrepreneur to the other and going all the way to the government who actually allocates a lot of funds, supports young startup and ventures, and those who are um, growing in need, scale up support and that. And of course, our department that is here to support you, even if it's um, of course in networking and opening and identifying the right person to start, to start with and to be um, associated with, even if by just giving you the information about the, all the events, all the ways you can, be part of the ecosystem and thinking with you exactly um, what is the best way to enter the ecosystem. As, uh, just as my colleague said, it's free, uh, of course, it's in the confidential, and we'll be very happy to expand the um, presence of Canadian companies starting from startup and on to uh, multinational companies. Now I wanted to introduce um, Inbal, and Inbal and I go way back, actually. And she is not just a serial entrepreneur and a tech influencer, because as she said, she was born and raised on Ums in Chutzpah. And she turned the whole thing into a book, even. Uh, but you, Inbal actually had a very, very interesting way that she did in the Tel Aviv and, and the Israeli high tech scene. So, hi, Inbal, it's great to have you here. And hi, hi. I want hello, to everyone. To tell them a little bit about your way, because when I wanted to just shorten it, uh, I couldn't really grasp the whole thing. So I wanted you to tell them a few of the major steps that you went through in your way. Sure. Thank you very much, Michal. And I'm very happy to be here with you all. Um, I'll just say that I'm a, a proud Tel Avivian. I live in Tel Aviv, and this is my office in the center of Tel Aviv on Rochard Boulevard. Uh, but I also have a very warm uh, place in my heart for Montreal because uh, my youngest son danced with uh, Le Grand Ballet de Montréal. Um, and we were supposed to join this summer, the, the, the summer program with him. Um, hopefully next summer uh, without COVID, we will, uh, we will come and visit Montréal. So for me personally, um, my career started in the military. Um, and I think this is also somehow connected to the conversation of course uh, of today. Um, I was, uh, uh, I'm a former lieutenant in 8200 Israel's um, elite um, intel unit, uh, which is well known for producing and building generations of entrepreneurs, focusing especially um, on deep technologies um, and engineering. Um, and I myself, uh, I'm a veteran of this unit. Um, my entire career in the tech ecosystem, um, in different positions, and in the past um, 10 plus years, fostering, nurturing, um, and helping accelerating um, early stage entrepreneurs, early stage startups um, in different capacities. 
when we first, I'm not sure if it's when we first met, but you were actually, one of the things that you founded was taking this very known uh, army unit, intelligence unit, 8200, its um, strength and its network in favor of the ecosystem. Can you shed a little bit about light about that? Yes, of course. How did it ever occur to you? Sure. So 8200, for those of you who don't know, is the equivalent of the NSA. Um, it's in Israel a military organization. It's part of the military. Um, hence, it is um, occupied or, or uh, by 18, 19, 20-year-old talent. Now, these 18, 19, 20-year-old kids, just like my son, who's now 19 in, in the military, they are the professionals um, in this um, extremely elite tech unit. Um, and they are responsible for coming up not just with intelligence, uh, meaningful intelligence, uh, but also with the technologies behind um, these different Intel solutions. And um, so there's one layer in this unit, which is deep technology and, and really um, deep innovation, okay, and creativity and a very agile mindset. Um, and a very bootstrapped mindset because the unit operates in relatively limited resources, very short time frames, and huge challenges. Now, when you put all of that together, um, the outcome is a mindset, um, a very entrepreneurial, innovative mindset. In addition to, so that's one thing, but in addition to that, there is a very vast network of alumni of this unit who um, have succeeded along the past 50 plus years of the Israeli tech ecosystem um, and have created some of Israel's most meaningful startups um, that are really interested in, in helping newcomers or new entrepreneurs. And so 10 years ago, we started, or 11 years ago, we started Israel's first startup accelerator on behalf of the alumni of 8200 but not limited to 8,200 graduates, actually bringing our knowledge, our experience, our network, our mindset uh, for early stage entrepreneurs in a variety of industries. And this is today one of the leading and very successful and, um, and now it's have even, you know, different uh, kind of uh, subsidiary uh, accelerator program, one that focuses Correct. on impact, in, impact companies on dedicated for women supporting. So it's great to see this um, legacy that you're uh, living there. But I was very surprised to find, growing up in this uh, ecosystem, I was very surprised to find, I, I took it for, um, for uh, um, I understood that this is, I thought that this was the way in this entrepreneurial ecosystem all around the world. The fact that you can just um, go to people and, ask them about, and, you know, get the support and get their attention. Maybe sometimes they're investors that are very busy and of course very sought after. And sometimes they are entrepreneurs, other struggling entrepreneurs on different stages, but they're very willing to share their insight, their thoughts. And when I was starting my entrepreneurial way, I was amazed by it, but took it again, like it's everywhere. And I understand that it's not the way it works like you. Do you know why? Do you have any thoughts on that? So I think, um, and you know, you've mentioned the book, I'll just take the opportunity and show everyone the book. So Chutzpah, uh, the, this book I published uh, in the US actually by Harper Collins um, is a book about Israeli innovation and the tech ecosystem, but it looks at it from uh, uh, the human factor, um, from the mindset. And, and I completely agree with you, Michal, that one of the core elements that, um, differentiates the Israeli ecosystem from others is this um, notion of wanting to be a very strong individual, a very opinionated, opinionated successful, hopefully prominent entrepreneur innovator, but at the same time also be something larger than just yourself. Um, and I think this is part of the explanation of what you've just mentioned. Um, the 8200 Accelerator is a non-for-profit one. There are many like that in Israel. And wanting to help each other is something that is, is really grounded and rooted um, in our mindset. Now, in addition to that, another differentiator that we have from the human factor perspective um, is the fact that 
some of our experience and knowledge is skill-based, is experience-based. So let's take, for example, um, a lot of technologies or knowledge that comes out of the military, but then Israeli entrepreneurs are taking that expertise, taking that knowledge and actually bringing it, transitioning it into a different industry, into a different world. And so the fact that you are capable here in Israel to transition from healthcare to robotics, to automation, computer vision, okay? And you could do that um, within your career creates a lot of diffusion, a positive one between different people. And I think that complements um, the fact that people create a very strong network around them. We really have to um, really finish and wrap up, unfortunately, because time is pressing. But just in the last few words, do you think that, though it's a very Israeli thing, we can also, Canadians that will come and enjoy the Montreal Entrepreneur, will enjoy that? They can take part of it? So I, I always say that uh, um, the chutzpahdik mindset, which obviously, you know, is very present here in Israel, comprises of uh, a, a collection of skills that actually everyone anywhere in the world possess. It's just a matter of awareness, intent, and practice. Um, so I definitely think that different ecosystems around the world, including the Montreal one, um, possess these soft skills that are so critical um, in addition to know-how and expertise and deep understanding of technology. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, creating the right environment, dynamics, systems to support that. Um, and, and, you know, and just like in the gym, start practicing it. Definitely. Well, thank you very much, Inbal, Alexandra. We'll give you back the floor and thank you, everyone. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. This was so interesting, Inbal, Michal. Uh, it's very impressive, your ecosystem, and I love the concrete examples you give. I think uh, Montreal is not at the same level of maturity, and we still have a lot to learn from you guys, but it's very, very inspiring. So um, I'll hand it now over to our next speaker, who will address some of the business culture differences between both cities, which uh, should be quite interesting for those of you uh, who would like to learn more, more about uh, how, how you work in those two different uh, cultures. So I give it over to Anat Katz, who is Minister Trade Affairs US and Canada at the Consulate General of Israel in New York. Yeah, just have to unmute your microphone. No. Okay. There we go. <laughs> there we go. And thank you very much. Let me just operate my presentation. Can you see my screen? Very well. Okay, fantastic. So uh, thank you uh, so much. And it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, to be here this morning. Um, I have the very uh, nice and I think the pretty much the easiest task in this uh, very distinguished panel to talk a little bit about the business culture, so more on the soft um, side of, of things. I will say again that like listening to the presentations both by the Quebec, uh, Quebec representatives as well as uh, my Israeli colleagues, uh, I found all of it really fascinating and also I think that the most important point is that it's really, I think, highly compatible. And I think that this is what we um, are seeking to do here to create the bridges and connections because together we're probably better. So uh, I will um, address um, just a little bit. I'll introduce my office and, and, and what we do. So we're Israel's economic and trade mission. Uh, we're the trade mission to Canada and basically the trade mission to, uh, uh, to North America. What we do and what we engage on on a regular basis is that we provide assistance to Israeli companies um, that are interested in uh, uh, bringing the products, technology solutions into the Canadian markets, identifying partners, working collaboratively on uh, R&D projects, 
um, and establishing any type of business contact. Uh, we also provide consulting to Canadian companies in search of Israeli partners, and we link them to Israeli sources, we link them directly to Israeli partners, we help them if they want to visit Israel and meet with relevant Israeli companies. So basically, we work with the individual companies, and we also organize webinars, seminars, pre-COVID, post-COVID, uh, trade shows and exhibitions. We have an office in, in Toronto, and we work very collaboratively and closely with our consulate um, in Montreal. So what I was thinking that I would do um, is maybe to touch a little bit on the Israeli business culture, its characteristic. Now, this is not my uh, characterization, so I just wanted to uh, give credit where credit is due. This is by Osnat Lautman, who's a cross-cultural communication consultant. And basically, you know, you see the acronym here on the uh, slide for Israeli, and, you know, maybe we should talk a little bit about what this, uh, what this stands for. And I'm starting actually with, with this picture, and I think that my colleagues from Tel Aviv touched on the number of uniforms that we have. Um, so this is uh, an example of, of uh, a, a unicorn of Israelis. The founders are Nisim Tapiro and Alon Khoury. And I just brought this picture, not to talk about the, unicorn, the unicorns themselves or the business opportunity, but basically, you know, if you could just look at this picture, and this, is with, this was taken on the day, you know, that they kind of reached that milestone, you can see how informal Israelis are. So we're not talking about business people with um, suits. Uh, you see that they're very casual, they're very informal, you know, by what they wear and the way that they are and the way they carry themselves. And I'm highlighting this because I think it's important to note that while Israelis, this is how we often, many of us, you know, look like, and, and they may come even, you know, to meetings. Uh, not very formal, usually not this casual, but not very, very formal. At the same time, you know, I think that there's no question as to how serious of business people these two folks are. So I think that this is one important key characteristic of, of Israelis that one should note. We're pretty informal, we're very friendly, very outgoing, you know, we're, we're chattery. We often talk, you know, a little bit beyond the discussion itself. People may ask, you know, like, are you married? Do you have kids? These types of things. It's, it's kind of a part of a socializing thing that we have in Israel that we also bring into the business exchange often because people are very into the relationship itself. So this is something just to know not to take offense and not to interpret um, in a negative way. Uh, the second thing, and maybe the, the, the picture is a little bit harsh, but um, we are also very straightforward, meaning that Israelis, they often do not possess the ability to walk around the bush, even if they wanted to, and usually they don't even want to. Israelis are pretty straightforward, very open people, uh, sometimes blunt. So, you know, that's kind of the downside uh, of this characteristic. But the upside is that if you ask somebody for their opinion, most likely you will actually get his or her opinion. Um, and I think that this characteristic really uh, helped us also to move and move quickly, you know, because we, we, we don't spend as much time on, you know, kind of sugarcoating something or being very, very subtle and leaving like place to doubt. We actually say what we think. Um, and sometimes this is harsh, but, but effective feedback. Um, so again, I think that for us Israelis, uh, it may be worthwhile uh, to also um, learn a little bit more diplomatic skills uh, because not everybody is built this way. But at the same time, um, again, if you encounter Israelis and you know they're being very open and very blunt, they're not trying to insult you or offend you. That's part of our culture. Um, we're just being pretty frank and, and to the point. 
Another thing that is very characteristic of, of Israelis and especially the entrepreneurs, and especially in the, in the startup um, sector, is that we are risk takers. So, you know, we're kind of at the end, edge of the cliff, um, sometimes uh, uh, figuratively and hopefully in other times uh, metaphorically. Uh, but we take risks, we, we're relatively comfortable, you know, uh, there. Um, and this is something uh, that, again, you will see uh, interacting with Israeli business people. Another thing is that we're very ambitious. We aim high, the sky's the limit, or maybe not even the sky's the limit. And pretty much the combination of these two characteristics, the risk taking and, and, and the ambition that many Israelis possess, uh, makes us very entrepreneurial. And, um, you know, I think that Michal showed the slide uh, that mentioned how high up Israel ranks uh, for startups worldwide. And this is pretty much uh, the reason why, I mean, they also touched obviously on a number of other characteristics, including um, the army service uh, and the fact that people from different disciplines uh, kind of converge and come together uh, creating new more ideas, but you know, if you couple this with uh, tons of ambition and with a lot of risk taking and willingness, you know, to try things, this is where you see all the startups, and this is where the where the entrepreneurial spirit is really coming from. Another thing that again you should just know, and this might be a little bit too harsh uh, uh, a picture to portray this trait, but uh, we're kind of loud. So um, I, prior to this posting, I spent five years in Washington, DC. And I must say that when we moved back to Israel, my kids who were uh, in the American uh, educational system were somewhat shocked. Uh, when they arrived at Israel, uh, everybody seemed very, very loud to them, both the kids, the teachers, everybody, people in the supermarket, um, you know, and they just, they, they, they could not figure out why people were yelling at them um, and so on. And um, also even here, sometimes, you know, when an Israeli company, when an Israeli company comes and when I interact with them in Hebrew, some of the people um, in my team who are local, uh, you know, in the end, when we discussed, they said like, was everything okay? Uh, you know, was like, and, and I was like, yeah, we had a very friendly, nice conversation. You know, why, why would you ask? And they know you seem to have been having a row or, or a fight or a disagreement. Um, and I was like, no, we were having actually a very, very pleasant and friendly conversation. Um, so we're loud. Sometimes we don't notice it. Um, we don't mean anything by it. Again, that's just kind of uh, our way of, of interacting primarily with each other, but also uh, sometimes with, with other people. Um, and the last one is that we're improvisers. It doesn't mean that we don't have a plan. We, we always have a plan. It's just that uh, because we're informal, because we're risk-taking, because we're entrepreneurial, we have to live a lot of room to changing to an ever-changing environment and to do this very quickly and to adapt. So this is part of the um, Israeli entrepreneur's DNA that they like to improvise or they're able to improvise. They're not afraid of improvising and many, many good things actually happen because of the fact that while you have a plan, you do not necessarily stick to every, uh, everything you know, exactly as planned, and you're willing to divert a little bit if need be. Um, so we see this as a strength, but at the same time, if you are to partner with an Israeli company, you need to kind of be aware of the fact that that's part of the DNA, that they would, you know, if need be, they would improvise. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not a big deal usually uh, to improvise and often it works. Um, so after we discussed, you know, uh, all this, what does it actually mean, you know, for, for, for us to interact with each other. So maybe we should just address like a very shortly, a few, very few do's and don'ts. So do's and don'ts doing business with uh, in Israel or with Israelis. So do, 
I encourage everybody to also be direct. Uh, you know, we find that that's really the best means of communication and that, it, you know, it's, it really saves time uh, and a lot of like uh, uh, situations where, where there are like uh, uh, messages coming, coming off in the wrong way. So if you're able to be direct, avoid subtleties, not always the Israeli side would kind of get the subtleties. They're not very used to kind of tracking uh, those and they tend to kind of understand what you say literally. So if you say very interesting, they would say they would feel that you probably were interested uh, as opposed to very interested, but not for now, very interesting, but maybe for somebody else, very, you know, so um, Try to be clear on your intention that would be uh, helpful in your relationship uh, with the Israeli partner. Uh, prepare for everything relating to a potential deal to be discussed in a business meeting. So even if you have a set agenda, um, they may raise other things, again, because they, they, uh, they're, they improvise if something comes up, they would address it. Um, if they have an idea that they want to, that they just thought of, they may want to kind of uh, mention this, even if it wasn't planned. So just be prepared from your end, you know, that um, there are best laid, best laid plans and also there's actual real life and there's a little bit of a gap, you know, sometimes between them. And again, I think it's for the best. In terms of don'ts, um, again, don't be surprised if there's a sudden change in plans and don't be offended, as we said, if they speak loud. And also one thing that I noted in many, many discussions between Israeli companies and local ones, often at a certain point, um, you know, the Israeli company would try to explain something and the message might not have been completely fully understood on the other side. Um, you know, um, this always happens between people. That's why we have communication for, and this is why we talk. Israelis, often say, no, <laughs> you did not understand. Let me explain this to you. And, you know, I hear this as a kind of, you know, as, as somebody who helped set up the meeting and, and often, you know, I, I, kind of, I feel bad inside because I, I think that often to American ears or Canadian ears, this uh, type of expression may, may sound offensive. Like, what do you mean? I did not understand, and why do you want to explain things to me, right? Uh, but they mean this in the really best possible way. They don't mean to, it's not like a blame uh, kind of thing. They don't blame you. They just feel that they might not have been completely understood, and they do want to take the opportunity and explain it further. The choice of words might not be ideal, but just don't be offended if they if, if this is what they say, they don't mean this in a negative way. Um, for our Israeli friends uh, doing business in Canada, um, it is important to respect the local culture. It's very important to be punctual, to be on time for meetings. Um, the Canadians prefer much longer lead time uh, than the Israelis. So it's important to plan things in advance if you're working on a project. Um, Canadians would want ample time. They require more predictability and that really helps them often to function much better in the relationships. So since this is a partnership, uh, it's important to be sensitive uh, to that as well. Um, one thing that, you know, you shouldn't do is assume that everything is the same as in the U.S., you know, as an example, uh, people from Quebec, they speak French, you know, very different from the U.S. and also a very distinct and different culture. So don't assume that your experiences from the United States can be um, translated into Canada, you know, um, or, or be the exact same thing as what you should expect in Canada. You should really learn the environment and learn the people that you're dealing with um, and not, not assume. Um, also, for Canadians, uh, I think this is really international, and I think that Israelis enjoy this as well. But you know, the structure uh, is important, and, and basing things on actual facts, uh, facts and figures and numbers uh, would take you a long way. So, uh, as many of those that you can share to support your claim. It would be your claim or your argument or your proposition will be probably better received 
um, at the other end. So um, we mentioned some, some of the business challenges in communications is that Canadians, you know, unlike Israelis, they do not necessarily say no directly. They may use phrases like, you know, and I will think about this, or this is interesting, um, to indicate that, you know, this might not be a good time for this. Um, Israelis should note that, um, and the Canadians should note again that Israelis are much more direct and appreciate just a free straightforward you know response like now is not a good time for us you know to look into this more deeply you know would probably uh, you do the trick so despite the apparent differences israelis and canadians complement each other and can be great business partners and to be very honest uh working in making the connections more often than not this is the result that we're seeing and this is definitely the <clears throat> sorry this is definitely the result that we're working towards. And I think that pretty much everybody in this panel um, is, is working from a different angle uh, towards that. And uh, with that, uh, I'll end my, my part of the presentation. I would like to thank you. I invite you all to reach out to us if you're interested in any uh, connection from uh, Israel to Canada or Canada uh, to Israel. These are uh, our emails. I do want to uh, highlight Ezekiel Barmash, our Director of Business and Trade Development. He's based in uh, Toronto, and this is his email. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I send it back to you, Alexandra. Yes, thank you, uh, Anna. This was so interesting. God, I love that I could have uh, taken even more. Um, so thank you very much. We are... Uh, a little bit uh, behind on schedule, but uh, we can uh, extend, I believe, until 10.35, more or less. So we have, uh, we'll go right away to our panel. Uh, that uh, should be also very interesting. So for about 15 minutes. Um, so I would uh, like to um, invite uh, Nira Gev, who is head of the TD Innovation Center in Tel Aviv, uh, Dr. Abdul Shaba, who is founder of Humanitas, and the panel will be moderated by Professor Daphna Kariv, who is head of the dual program, Entrepreneurship Business Administration at the Adelson School of Entrepreneurship and affiliate professor at HEC Montreal. So I'll give it over to you. Thank you. So good morning, the people from Montreal and good afternoon to us, the Israeli ones. Um, again, I'm very happy like everyone else and very excited to be here. Um, and to discuss a bit about the, the ecosystems. Um, I, I was lucky enough to, uh, to be in Montreal, to visit Montreal for three weeks. I just came back to Israel, felt very well the cultural differences. It happens to me every time. Um, I represent the academic part of those uh, connections between the ecosystems, uh, the, the Montreal ones, one and the uh, Israeli one. And actually, um, I'm here um, due to a very, very successful collaboration we have with, with HSC Montreal, uh, La Base Entrepreneurial, I hope I pronounce it well, uh, which is um, an extremely interesting, vibrant, dynamic accelerator uh, embedded in the uh, Academia of uh, AGC Montreal. Uh, Luis uh, Cisneros, the professor, the head, the initiator, um, was the one that actually initiated this uh, collaboration as well with you. Um, he couldn't be here today, but um, he's really the, I would say, the um, energy uh, around and behind all these, uh, all these research, teaching, and uh, other projects uh, that we uh, conduct together. Yeah. So um, I'm very sorry. Sorry. Oops, sorry, Anat. I think you'll have to mute your microphone. Sana, you can do it by yourself. It's a bit rude, but we just discussed about that. 
Yeah, I know. I'll see with the Chamber of Commerce because I don't seem to have the. Oh, now it's muted. Okay, perfect. Sorry about this. Yeah, so that, that's okay. So I'm very pleased to have here Neil and Abdul um, and to gain some insights from you, both of you, each one of you from different perspectives on what does it mean to be part of two different ecosystems. Um, so I start by uh, asking you to uh, just to uh, describe a bit what you do and who are you uh, for two minutes and then I have some questions for both of you. Neil, could you start? Sure, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, so my name is Neil Agiv. Uh, I'm the CEO and head of TD Innovation Center. Uh, this is a subsidiary of uh, the TD Bank Group. Uh, I'm sure uh, most of you at least uh, know TD. Um, TD is you know, one of the biggest banks in Canada and four years ago they opened an innovation center. So far, uh, the purpose of the center is generally focused on cybersecurity. We, are, we have two types of operations here. One is a fusion center. A fusion center is different team members from different teams are working collaboratively in order to deal with security incidents. So TD has three of those, one in Toronto, one in Singapore, and one in Israel, and we are working in a follow the sound model. Uh, we are tapping into the local talent uh, pool of, uh, of cyber experts, and we are recruiting them in order to deal with, uh, with cyber crime. And the second type of operation is the innovation. We are looking into the Israeli ecosystem, but also into the worldwide uh, cyber ecosystems in order to find the latest and greatest technologies in order to make a firm decision uh, if TD can benefit uh, such technologies. So we, we built a lab, a very uh, modern and sophisticated lab, and, in, and we are um, experimenting and evaluating different solutions uh, from all around the, the world in order to decide which one is the best for TD Bank to make an investment. That's the, the main things that uh, the two different teams are doing. Thank you very much. Abdul, please. Well, thank you, Daphne. It's a pleasure to be here and it will be even more. It's a huge pleasure to go back to Israel again. It's a lovely country and I always uh, enjoy being there. Uh, so um, I'm the CEO of Humanitas. We are a deep tech company specialized in uh, information technology for emergency response, which is a specialty like uh, for, from, for a lot of uh, Israeli companies. Uh, my actual career is in healthcare as an emergency doctor and disaster response specialist. And I founded Humanitas after uh, many a few years after having de been deployed with the Canadian Red Cross in Haiti and following the cholera epidemic, of course, uh, the, and the earthquake. So what we're trying to do is to solve the challenge on how to bring cloud-based technologies and artificial intelligence to the field when there is no connectivity and no cloud computing at all. So we found that this kind of deep tech is critical for many sectors uh, outside of the emergency response, including aerospace, healthcare, mining, and agriculture. And uh, so we have developed a complete set of cloud-based uh, system, uh, the cloud-based technologies that even that can work even in areas where there is no infrastructure. And we enable uh, of the shelf devices like your smartphones can work and connect to all the other smartphones, even if there's no cell connectivity and nothing. So, and can connect to robots, including drones to work off the grid. So we are very focused in our expertise in emergency response. And this is one of the um, like reasons why we connected with uh, a lot of the Israeli universities and some of the companies and we enable or know how in telecommunication, cloud computing, AI, and robotics for that. So our solutions have been deployed and tested in many environments and more recently in healthcare sector for pandemic response. Thank you very much, very interesting. Could you share both of us, uh, we'll start by Neil, uh, the challenges that you have in working with two different ecosystems? We'll start by the challenges and then we'll see what are the benefits and the profits. So me please. Okay, uh, I, can, I can specify a few. Uh, so, so first I would say that uh, one of the biggest challenges is the, the differences between uh, working for a large bank, uh, which has like a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, well-defined procedures and things 
can sometimes take some time from one hand. And on the other hand, working with the, the ecosystem, with the startup companies that wants to, to move uh, very, very quick. So we are trying to bridge this gap and, uh, and work with the startups very, very quick, but also set the ground for, for, the, for TD, set all the stage. Uh, so if we decide to move forward with a specific startup, the uh, things would be much faster and much clearer than if we weren't uh, exist. Um, the other challenge is the culture. I think uh, Anat uh, described it uh, very, very well. Uh, startups, uh, you know, can really a meeting with a potential customer like TD can can be live or die for them in some cases, and they are very eager to do business with uh, large financial institutions. Uh, so there is, uh, you know, the, the gap between how much they want to to make this work, and uh, from TD, in some cases, we see a lot of. Uh, a lot of companies and there are many stakeholders that uh, my team is working. So again, we are trying to bridge this gap and, and be very, uh, from one hand, tell the startups exactly where, where they are and what are the chances to actually uh, uh, make like a, a, a sale and a successful deployment. And on the other hand, work with the uh, TD stakeholders in order for, for them to be to, to be aware of what the startup is expecting from us and how not to kill the startup with uh, all the bureaucracy and all the requests that sometimes a large uh, financial institution can uh, uh, throw to to a small startup. Um, okay, thank I can you. specify a few more if we have the time, but I think uh, for now that's, uh, that's all. Okay, thank you very much, Neil. Abdul, please. Well, I think the challenges are on multiple levels. The first one is uh, to know each other. So initiating the first encounter, I think uh, the system was extremely helpful in our case. We were introduced initially to by the government of Quebec when we were on our official visit uh, with a delegation to Tel Aviv. But um, the first, first time was through one of the accelerators. You mentioned the National Bank accelerator of HSC Montréal. And since that initial visit, I had the opportunity to go multiple times. So I think the first Thing. The first challenge is just to know, know each other. And, and, and I think today's opportunity to discuss is uh, very, very uh, important. And we shall have more opportunities to exchange on the collaborate, potential collaboration. The other challenge is, I mean, is to maintain the relationship. So uh, I, I think there are multiple programs that were there that helped into making this happen. In our case, we were um, uh, grateful and lucky. And we had the Israeli um, Innovation Authority and here the government Ministry of Innovation supporting a large project, a multi-million dollar project for, for, um, to team up with the Israeli company. And that is something that uh, helped a lot. So that, that challenge of maintaining relationship was in, was really overcome with uh, some of the help. And the other one, I mean, think it was mentioned is a cultural challenge, you know, what's in it for me? And then always find what is the best uh, opportunity to collaborate and what kind of uh, exchange of expertise, know-how. And I think there is a lot of complementarity that should be uh, leveraged. Uh, we have a lot of research, good research being done here. There is a huge uh, expertise and skill in business development in Israel. I think they have also a lot of expertise in some specific areas. So I think that complementary aspect can bring very meaningful solutions, uh, but the challenges are there to be able to have this integration at a distance. So I think some of um, uh, there, there is much to discuss also on the uh, some of the cultural gap, but all this is a plus, it can be overcome. And I think it can bring more benefit even for any future collaboration. Thank you very much. I think I have uh, time for one more question. So um, the question would be, what are your tips uh, based on your successful stories? Because each one of you have uh, a successful story. So what is it? And uh, what can we gain from you, from your insights and best practices about how to connect better uh, and more thoroughly and profoundly with each one uh, of the ecosystems? Please. Okay, so actually we did a, a meetup, uh, I think more than a year ago before uh, COVID started uh, for startups with uh, something like 10 tips 
for startups, uh, how to work with, uh, with big financial institutions. Uh, but since time is pressing, we'll do a very, a very quick one. So first of all, I, I would say that we have many different success stories. So ever, ever since we started, uh, the Fusion Center is a, an integral part of, of the TD ecosystem. And now it's something that uh, uh, is working uh, for eight hours a day and uh, they have shifts and that, that's very important. But on the innovation uh, side of things, uh, I can say that we reviewed hundreds of uh, startups. We've evaluated maybe 30, 40 or something like this. And I think TD is implemented and in the process of implementing something like uh, maybe 10 to 15 uh, technologies out of this uh, pool. So uh, we have several success uh, uh, stories uh, from Israel and from uh, across uh, the, the globe as well. Uh, maybe just to, to share a few tips for, for you know, maybe those of you who are working in a startup company. So in many cases, a uh, startup is coming to us with one uh, you know, type of a solution, but you know, we are uh, hearing what they're doing and, and maybe taking this to, to a different place. So in some cases, startup was uh, smart enough to, to maybe listen and did maybe some small adjustments and that opened uh, different uh, business opportunities for them, not just by selling to TD, uh, but also they took our advices and uh, also uh, sold it to, to other, uh, to other uh, companies as well. In many cases where, where startups did not make a sale eventually, did not uh, reach to a deployment, they could still leverage the process. So by uh, introducing a startup to my team and maybe other teams in TD and eventually us deciding not to move forward, uh, if you are doing the process correctly, you would still benefit a lot of uh, knowledge and understanding about what at least some customer may need. And that also uh, would help you maybe uh, prepare the, the next gen of your solution or, or maybe uh, decide to change few uh, roadmap items. And that's also uh, was something that was very good for, for the startups. Uh, maybe the last tip that I would share again, since time is passing, is to be prepared. Uh, my team is really trying to help the different speakers of the startups to understand what are the audience they are going to meet. If they are going to meet a very, uh, you know, a senior executive, they need to prepare a very different pitch than if they are talking to the technical teams that actually are going to participate in the evaluation. In many cases, we saw companies using the same decks for different audiences and the whole meeting uh, was kind of missing. And my team is really trying to, to help the startup succeed in their journey uh, ever since they, they meet TD and until they either uh, get you know, a, a contract or, or a rejection. But in, in both scenarios, I think if you leverage uh, the process correctly, you would benefit something. And, uh, yeah, very quickly, I think uh, to build a re good relationship, uh, we must uh, meet and visit each other's often and build and integrate within the network. I think that's key. Uh, so uh, if it's uh, a possibility, I think a uh, visit to Israel is a must have. So it, it helps to really build a meaningful relationship. Second is biz um, Israeli people are very straightforward. I mean, I mean, really, so business discussion must be done first. The business mindset of Israeli uh, companies is great, but this needs to be discussed first. And this is critical for any businesses. And the cultural aspect is uh, important to, to learn and deal with. And finally, uh, we should never underestimate you know, the links that we can do together through uh, some of the organization. Here, we are uh, lucky to have the Chamber of Commerce. The embassies are ex great. Uh, we had uh, the, um, here the uh, consulate in Israel and the embassy in Canada, very helpful on multiple discussions. So the government initiatives are, have to have more international collaborations is a huge, huge thing uh, that, you know, incentive that can bridge between uh, both uh, uh, both countries, and I think that that needs to be used uh, as often as possible. So, those will be the three tips that I will say.
Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you very much, Alexandra, Dina. See you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you much, much, Daphna, Nir, Abdul. Thank you very much uh, for this interesting discussion. Uh, so we're coming to the end of the uh, webinar part. So before starting the networking session, uh, I would like to um, to introduce my, the last speaker, who is um, uh, Paul, uh, Sir Paul, uh, Mr. Paul Hirschen, who is the Consul General of Israel in Montreal. So I give it over to you for the closing remarks, and I'll get back to you with the last logistical information. Um. Thank you, Alexandra. Bonjour, tout le monde. Je viens d'arriver à, à Montréal et c'est un peu difficile pour moi de parler en uh, français. And also for my Israeli colleagues, um, I will I will stick to English, but I hope to to become fluent enough to chat with everybody here in Montreal in 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 French. Um, I, I just want to first of all say thank you to everybody for participating. Um, I myself, before joining the foreign ministry, I spent uh, 10 years in the high tech sector in Israel, uh, based in Tel Aviv, traveling around the world. Um, and, and I would summarize it all in one word, and that is creativity. It's incredible. The, the Israeli developers have a solution for every problem. Um, they don't necessarily know what the problem is, but when you explain it to them, they will resolve it, they will solve it. So I'm looking forward to meeting with those of you in uh, Montreal, in Quebec, that I haven't yet met. And I'm looking forward to hosting the Israelis here in Montreal and around the, the province of Quebec. Um, the consulates at uh, both of your disposal, the Israelis and the Quebecois, the Canadians here in, in the region. Um, and thank you very much, everybody, for participating. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hirschen. Uh, and thank you to all our panelists and collaborators who made this event possible. So unfortunately, uh, we don't have time for the, the, the question period, but I invite all of you who are still available um, to join the networking sessions. Um, those of you who completed your profile by Monday, they received pre-assigned one-on-one -one meeting invitations on Pair Connects. Uh, alternatively, uh, alternatively, there are also two, two open networking rooms uh, that you can join to meet and greet other participants who will be there. Uh, once again, thank you very much for all your the panelists for their excellent presentations and generous contributions. Very much appreciated. It was a pleasure having you all here today. Uh, thank you for the participants for joining us today. And uh, we hope to see you all at the networking session. Thank you very much. Have a great day.